G'day, I'm John Cowan. Thank you for letting me into your bubble. I've got a few ideas for nourishing your children. Fortunately, I'm not talking about food because I'm a rotten cook. You wouldn't really want my, my cooking advice. But I'm talking about nourishing the whole child, meaning things to nourish their heart and mind as well. Now, there's a lovely idea that I heard about many years ago called the emotional tank. Imagine that I've got this tank inside of me. Actually, if you could see a bit more of me, you could probably think that I've got quite a substantial tank inside of me. But this is my emotional tank, my tank that gets filled up with good feelings and good emotions when people are kind to me, when things are going well, when um, I'm making progress. And uh, when my tank is full because people have been nice and interacting and listening to me and they've let me into the queues of the traffic and all those nice things, when they're happening to me and I'm feeling my emotional tank is full, I feel good, I make good decisions. I can be very nice to live with when my emotional tank is full. And I can even handle a bit of criticism without it crushing me too much. But the trouble is I leak especially if I'm getting tired and hungry. I just find my emotional tank draining away and it drains even faster if people ignore me or are mean to me or pick fights with me or any of those, any of those unpleasant things can drain your emotional tank. And when my tank is empty, I just don't feel good. I don't enjoy life. My decisions aren't as good. I'm not so much fun to be around. And even the kindest, most helpful advice hits me like harsh criticism. So this is a good insight because when you know how to top up someone's emotional tank, it can enhance your relationship in all sorts of ways. I just before we get to talking about kids, it's a wonderful tool to use in your adult relationships. You see, it is very, very hard to get the love that you want from someone if their emotional tank is empty. And so if you attend to your partner's emotional tank and top it up with kind words and smiles and listening to them and doing nice things for them, when their tank is full, you'll be amazed at what a lovely person you're sharing your life with. But it's also a very, very useful tool when it comes to parenting. I know that you know all sorts of good parenting techniques that you've picked up from all sorts of sources, but even the best parenting techniques in the world won't work if your child's emotional tank is empty. They just don't have it in them to be able to respond to your wonderful wisdom and kind advice. And there will be times when you can just tell your kids are empty if your kids are back at school. School, even if it's a good school with nice teachers and good playmates, it's tiring. And when the, by the time your kids get home from school, their emotional tank is empty. You might see them trudging up the drive and uh, you're thinking, right, let me at them. And the moment the poor kid gets in the door, you're straight at them. Don't you think about getting into that refrigerator. You just get straight down to your bedroom. Do you know what sort of a mess you left your room in this morning? Who do you think I am? Your slave or something? And there's foam flying off your lips. You've been waiting to do this for hours, but oh, give it a rest. That poor kid's tank is so empty, it's just not going to work. Instead, top them up first before you have to make that withdrawal from their emotional tank. And um, uh, it's like a seesaw. If you're gonna have to bring the kid down, you have gotta bring them up a bit first. So when they get through the door, greet them. G'day, how was your day? Let me get you something to eat. If it's the first time you've ever done it, the poor kid will probably go, oops, sorry, wrong house, and bolt out the door, they'll get such a fright. So topping up their tank, and there are ways of doing this, in fact, um, with I mentioned some ways with your partner and they'll work fine if your kids, the smiles, the kind words. But there is a set of tools that work very, very well for attending to someone's emotional tank. I came across it in marriage and relationship guidance training. And it's something that you may have seen before. It's the idea of the love languages. And um, I can't remember the name of the guy that came up with them. Um, I'll, 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 I'll make sure that I add the name down the bottom of the slide when I, when I look it up afterwards. But it's this basic idea that we are wired differently. And the way that I like to show love may be different from the way that you like to show love. And the things that make me feel loved may be different from you. And this idea is that there are at least five different love languages. And in my family of five people, my wife and three kids, 
it turns out that we all had a different love language, which has been remarkably convenient if I'm speaking on the topic. But for example, my wife, Naomi, if I buy her chocolates or flowers, it's never a dumb thing to do. But if I really want to make her feel loved, if I want her to really purr, I'll tell her what a wonderful wife she is and how much I love her and what a wonderful job she's doing as a parent. And, and she just melts because her love language is words, words of praise, words of affection. And it's the way she shows love as well. She praises me up. She praises the kids up. And it's been a big part of our relationship right from the start. Lots and lots of messages between us, both spoken and also written. And when we're apart, we're often apart because of business. We're always communicating by phone calls and texts and messages. It's a big part of our loving relationship. And it's the way that she feels most sensitive as well. I mean, she's very sensitive to words. If I'm harsh with my tone, if I'm a, um, if I omit to show my gratitude properly, she'll feel really, really wounded. But by the same token, she gets topped up again by words very readily. I mean, for her, the words in a greeting card are sometimes even more important than the present the card is attached to. She'll open it up and she'll read every line in that soft, sappy little poem that's printed inside as if it had been specially composed for her. Oh, oh, this is lovely. This is great. Me, I'm wired differently. I just rip the card off the package, look on the back to see how much it cost, and then rip into the wrapping paper. We're different. And our oldest boy, very different again. His love language has always been, I think, gifts. That's not to say that he's a selfish or mean or avaricious kid. I mean, he's incredibly generous. He always thought very carefully about the gifts and presents he gave others. And the things that he has, they have more than just value. They have meaning for him. He was the only one of our kids that um, uh, put things away. In, the, in, in a proper place and, and looked after his stuff. And he would get so offended if his little brother and sister went into his room and touched his stuff without his permission. And when he was a bit older, then with his mates, it was like they worked out their friendship in token form. They were endlessly swapping their musical equipment and sports gear and video games. And so that's his love language. My love language and I think for a lot of blokes, it's the same. Our love, my love language is serving my family. It's, it's doing things for people. It's why I pot around the house with my toolbox, pretending to fix things. It's why I, I work so hard. Now, I want to leave this here just a little bit because it might be sounding like an interesting insight, but I want to point out that this is a useful tool because you start to realize, hold on, what this person is doing for me or to me or whatever, it's actually that person saying they love me. Now I know two couples personally that reckon this insight has saved their marriage. They thought they were in a loveless marriage with not much going on. But when they got this insight about love languages, they suddenly realized I'm being loved to bits. It's just being spoken to me in a love language that I don't recognize. And could you know, you might be at home and you see your fella driving in the drive and you're thinking, oh, here he comes. He's going to come running up here and love me and hug me and kiss me. And no, he's gone in the garage again. Doesn't he love me anymore? Of course he loves you. That's why he's down in that garage fixing that lawnmower for you. So then you can show your love to him by doing the lawns for him on the weekend. You see how this love language thing works? It might not be your love language, but it's their love language and they're loving it a bit. So how, how do you, you know, how do you cope? How do you, how do you feel loved? Well, you might have to do some translation work in your head. Petra Bagus, who I've worked with for a few years, she was telling me that she's a words person. She just l would love it if her man told her how much he loved her a bit more often than he does. But he's not a words person. His love language is serving, acts of kindness. And so she says that sometimes she'll come home from an evening gig and he'll be already in bed and she'll slide into bed and there'll be a hot water bottle waiting in the bottom of the bed for her. And she says, I translate that from his love language into my love language. That's him saying to me, I love you, but he's doing it through, word, through not through words, but through acts of service. 
And so uh, you might have to translate what someone else does. But can I just say, as a parent, it can be a wonderful thing if you can work out what the love language is for your individual children. You might be thinking, of course my child knows that I love them. I, I do things for her, I cook food for her, I run her everywhere, I'm coaching a netball team, I help her with her homework. Of course she knows that I love me. No, she might just think that you're a slightly frantic, manic, overworked woman who should slow down and give her a hug and a kiss every so often because your love language is serving, but hers is perhaps touch or being there for them. And so, um, or, or saying things in words. And uh, so can I just urge you to think, how can I show love languages in more than just my preferred love language? How can I show love in more than just my preferred love language? I don't know if your kids even have developed a set love language yet. Maybe they're too young, but we probably have already settled into our main way of showing love and we probably do it brilliantly. But could I just say your kids might feel incredibly loved and their emotional tank get topped up if you showed them love in their love language. And so here's your homework. I'd like you every day for every one of your children to show all five of the love languages. And could I just say, you'll have a lot of fun with this, but you'll also find it quite challenging because maybe you're not a words person. You're, and so speaking love to a child just feels a little bit awkward. I love, I love, I love, I'll get outside, you're okay. You know, you, you, might, you might get stuck on that, but maybe you could send them a text, just thought about you and you made me smile, or you drop a little note in their, in their lunchbox or something like that. Um, giving, I'm, I'm sure we're all very generous to our kids, but giving might mean letting them have access to something that's special, that uh, they know that you treasure. It might, and letting them uh, look at it or something, just sharing something with them. Acts of kindness, I'm sure that's obvious, but being there, my daughter, uh, middle child, she realized she was not the honored oldest, she was not the spoilt youngest, she was just the stuck in the middle, hand-me-down wearing, overlooked middle child who got hauled off to her older brother's soccer games and her little brother's recorder lessons. And I think middle children sometimes really, really appreciate one-on-one -on -one time with just one parent. And her love language, I think, has always been just being there for her, listening to her, one-on-one -on -one time, quality time. And so taking her out for a hot chocolate was, you know, always great. And uh, some of the best times I ever had with my Susie was taking her away on trips, just the two of us. When I had to travel overseas for some business, I took her with me. We had the most fantastic time, just the two of us. And uh, our, our youngest kid, well, especially when he was little, I think his love language was very much touch. It was very much uh, physical. But I don't, I'm not talking about hugs and kisses and cuddles. Oh, no, I wish. No, his way of showing love and affection to his dear old dad was to take me out in a flying tackle as I walked down the passage or to give me a nipple cripple or a wedgie or some other masculine form of affection. And getting him into bed at night, it was like WWF wrestling. You had to run and catch him and then haul him off to bed and he'd be giggling and shrieking and going up the walls and hiding under the blankets. And if it wasn't for the drugs we gave him, we wouldn't have got him to sleep at all. So each one of our kids was very different. Each of them responded to a different way of showing love to them. And uh, so can I just urge you to start thinking about this? What's my, can I just say, you've probably got more insights into other people's love languages than you do to your own. But you might like to think, what is my love language? What's your partner's love language? Think of your different children. And as I say, maybe the most valuable thing you can take from this is not working out what their love language is. It might be that you just diversify the ways you show your love and nothing top, tops up someone's love language more than being spoken to, being loved in their love language. Another thing which really tops up a person's emotional tank is good communication. Now, people often think that communication means talking, saying the right things, but honestly, I believe that listening is far more important as a communication tool than speaking. Sometimes the wisest, kindest, most loving thing you can say to your child is, mm, 
with a slightly constipated look on your face. Mmm, oh honey, how did that make you feel? And um, uh, repeating back to them what they say really lets them know that you've been attending and listening. And so you do a little bit of a paraphrase of what they've said and um, holding back your judgments and solutions. When people share problems with me, I very quickly want to leap in with, uh, with an answer, a solution to them. And um, I think it shows so much more respect if we just keep on asking our kids uh, to explain the problem and asking them, well, what could you do about this? What, what do you think would be a good, what do you think would be a good solution to this? And also it switches on their brain. It makes them a problem solver. It helps them to think through problems rather than automatically just doing what you tell them to do. They're thinking for themselves in the long run. That's going to be so much more valuable for them. Okay. This makes a child feel uh, so, so loved. There's a lovely phrase that I like, which says being listened to is so much like being loved. Most people can't tell the difference. And uh, so could I really urge you to step up the listening and it's amazing how much more loved your children will feel. That's, a, that's it for this session. Could I urge you, please don't stay stuck. There's lots of people you can get advice from. I'm sure your friends and in-laws and partner would be a great, would be great people to chat things over with, but maybe you need a bit more help than that. And there's the helpline 0800 568 856. Why don't you contact them if you're feeling really desperate in your parenting? Also, we're flesh and blood. And just like our bodies can catch viruses and bugs, we can sometimes get things going on between our ears that can make us very unhappy. Don't don't get stuck with your depression and anxiety. Get some help for it. Your doctor is always a good place to start, but there's also the uh, depression and anxiety helpline on the screen. Maybe if you're still under uh, lockdown, this would be a great time to go through some good parenting websites. And uh, could I recommend the Parenting Place, parentingplace.nz. I worked for them for years. They're a good crew and they've got lots and lots of good resources. So thank you for, for listening to this. Look, there's my email address. If you've got some questions, send them through to me or some feedback and maybe I can address your, issue, your issues or queries in a later session. Thank you so much for listening and I'll catch you later.